You ready for the word? Yes. Hallelujah. Me too. My message tonight, part one of the subject, authority over demons and disease. Turn with me in your Bible to Luke's Gospel, chapter 9. Let's pick up a few verses here. Luke 9, verse 1 and 2. Jesus called his 12 disciples together and gave them power and authority. Everybody say power. power. Everybody say authority. authority. I'll give you some more references on that in a little while. But I want to reread that verse. He called his 12 disciples together and gave them the authority to operate in his power over all demons and to cure diseases. He gave them authority to operate in his power to do. You understand? Verse 2, and he sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. Now, who are we talking about? We're talking about 12 disciples that have been with Jesus less than a year and a half. Maybe, well, right at two years, okay? How many of you have been a Christian, born again, spirit-filled believer, more than 24 months? Then you have as much qualification as the 12. And you have something they didn't have. Yes, they walked with Jesus and they walked in his anointing, but they were not born again, nor were they spirit-filled. That came later. And so simply obeying his word, they had authority over demons and over all afflictions, physical afflictions. That's where we're going tonight. Amen? Amen. Look at your neighbor and say, we have the authority. Look with me in chapter 10, verse 1. This is where he sent out the 70. Now, some translations, and even uh, in the gospel, it says he, sent, uh, uh, he appointed 72. And I think this is all a matter of translation of the words and everything. I believe he sent out the 72 by 2. I don't believe he sent out 72. Okay, I believe he sent out 72 in groups of twos, okay? You know, I tell you, if one can chase a thousand, two can do what? 10,000. He sent them out in groups of two, okay? So, hey, we can do it by ourselves, but if we team up, we can get a whole lot more done. And this is what I was trying to emphasize without spelling it out Sunday morning and Sunday night when I had the prayer warriors come up front and we had the prayer, chain to go, uh, prayer line to go through. I want this church to get back into action. You understand what I'm saying? Get back into action. Chapter 10, verse 1. After these things, the Lord appointed 70 others also, going beyond the 12 apostles. And he sent them two by two before his face into every city and place where he himself was about to go. He said to them, the harvest truly is great. The laborers are few. Pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Then he begins to give them a description of how they were to go and how they were to minister. And in verse 9, And heal the sick there and say to them, The kingdom of God has come near to you. The kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is up there somewhere. The kingdom of God is within us. At that time, the kingdom of God was with them. God for them, God with them, and God in them. How many of you know God is for you? Amen. How many of you know he's still for you when you're messing up? Yes. How many of you know that he'll never stop being for you? Amen? Amen. How many of you know he's with you? He said, I'll never leave you or forsake you. And how many of you know that he is in you? 
Folks, you can't lose. Hello. And he sent them to preach a message. The kingdom of God is near you. And they were simply saying, Jesus is coming. He said, go to those towns and tell them the kingdom of God is near. Tell them I'm coming. And while you're at it, heal everybody. Heal everybody. I want to try it one more time. Heal everybody. Going back to the scripture. Verse 17. When the 70 returned with joy, gladness, saying, Lord, even the demons were subject to us in your name. In your name, in your character. He said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I give you authority to operate in my power. I give you authority to trample or to perform on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt or hinder you. Now I want to pause there and I've taught this but let's reemphasize it. Serpents and scorpions. If you remember When the children of Israel were in a spirit of rebellion, snakes came out from under the rocks and began to bite people, and they were dying by the thousands. I think think 7,000 died. Moses went to God as an intercessor or mediator, and God said, make a serpent of brass, wrap it on a pole and lift it up. And everybody that looks to that brass serpent will be healed. Brass speaks of judgment. The serpent speaks of sin. Jesus became sin on the cross. And there the judgment for you and me took place. Our sins have already been judged. Hello. And when we look to the cross, we are made whole. When we look to the cross, we are made whole, spirit, soul, and body. How many of you have been to the cross? How many of you have looked at the cross? Tonight, I want you to declare that you are completely healed, completely whole, spirit, soul, and body, and give God praise for it. Hallelujah. Don't ever change your mind after tonight. It's done. If you go to the doctor's office and look at his diploma hanging on the wall, right in the very middle of it is a logo. And there's this pole in that logo with a snake wrapped around it. Whether that doctor is a Christian or not, his diploma says Jesus has healed him. You understand what I'm saying? And tonight I want to challenge you one more time. It's time for us to get in the business of doing what God's called us to do. Now, the scorpion, and the best place to find anything like this is to go back and look at the Egyptians. But the scorpion speaks to the mind. And the whole idea is people are troubled, depressed, oppressed, anguish, angry, different things like that. I want you to understand that we have authority to trample on serpents and on scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt, harm, or hinder you. 
And I'm not going to change my mind. How about you? And so the next time an issue comes up, I'm not going to let it move me. I'm going to stick with the word of God. Amen. Amen. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the demons were subject to you, that the spirits were subject to you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Your name is written down in heaven. I called the insurance company the other day and they didn't know my name. They didn't want my name. They wanted a number. And at that moment, I didn't have the number. They said, well, we can't help you. I know it. <laughs> Your name is written down in if you go back and study that out uh, using Old Testament and New Testament scriptures, you'll find it, your name is written in his hand. And what I like about that is if he opens his hand, he's releasing you. And you're released with authority and with power. Are you understanding what I'm doing? Okay. Now, Verse 21, in that hour, Jesus rejoiced. And the Greek word that's used there translates, he danced for joy. If you want the Greek word, it's spelled A-G-A-L-L-I-N-O. I'll spell it again. Yeah. Mm -hmm. A-G-A-L-L-I-N-O. -A -A and it means to dance for joy. How many of you want the victory? Dance for joy. How many of you want salvation? Dance for joy. How many of you want healing? Dance for joy. How many of you want to see the devil put under your feet? Dance for joy. You know what dancing for joy does? It stomps all over the devil. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 Woof. We're going to get in the business. I'm not just an employee at Walmart. I work at Walmart. See the difference? We've got a lot of people professing to be a Christian. It's time we start working, acting, talking, living like a Christ-like individual. Hallelujah. It's one thing to say it. It's another thing to do it. And it's time for us to begin to be doers of the word. Hallelujah. <laughs> Oh, glory to God. Now, Philippians is very important because it shows the nature of Christ reflecting the kind of nature we should have. Philippians chapter 2, verse 3. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit. But in lowliness of mind, humility, let each of us esteem one another better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own ministry or interests, but also for the ministry and interests of others. What can I do? to help promote your ministry. I have discovered that in doing that, it develops and promotes my own ministry. Putting other people first. Most people want the baptism in the Holy Spirit for selfish reasons. When Jesus said, I want you to go and minister but Terry, do you get the power to minister? Then go minister in the power. I authorize you to operate in the same power and get the same results that I have gotten. We'll come back to that. Verse 5. 
Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of man, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, has given him character which is above every character. And that same Greek word is also translated authority and has given him authority above every authority. Name, character, authority. And that at the name and character and authority of Jesus, every knee should bow of those in heaven and those on earth and those under the earth. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now people, I've been in the ministry a long time now. I have yet to see this kind of ministry in America. I did see it in other countries. And I think one of the most humbling experiences of my entire ministry happened in Morelia down in southern Mexico when a man was dying of cancer in the final stages. They put him in the back of a pickup truck to take him to the emergency room with the understanding he was not going to live through the day. He told them he said, take me to my church first. There is an American there. I want to pray for me. God's going to heal me. I didn't know that until after the fact. They got to the, house, they got to the church. I'm inside. I had uh, some of the youth from our church, a youth band. They were getting ready to do some music, and I was walk, showing them the order of the service. And the pastor came and got me and said, there's a man out here in a pickup truck that wants you to pray for him. That's all he told me. We go outside, and the minute I look at him, I see death. His wife is holding his hand, and she said, he wants you to pray for him. He believes he's going to be healed. If any two shall agree touching any matter, it shall be Done. There was a group of us that gathered around that trunk bed, and I took the brother by the hand. I prayed in English because I wasn't that good at Spanish. I let my interpreter interpret. After we finished praying, they took off to the hospital. The next day, the pastor takes me over to his house. He didn't die. We went into a little bedroom, the little bedroom, I mean, it, was big, it wasn't big enough to hold three or four people. But he was a lively little fellow just talking away. A few days after we came back to the States, the pastor sent me a picture in front of the church with a fellow standing next to him praising God. He was completely healed of cancer. I have seen many miracles like that outside of the United States. I've seen a few inside. I meant to bring them in here, but I've got a pair of crutches in my office right now that used to hang on the wall back here of a young girl in this church in a serious car wreck. The doctor said she would never be normal again. 
She laid those crutches down right there and walked away perfectly, completely healed. It's time for us to get back in God's business. No more talking about it. It's time to be a doer of the word. Hallelujah. If you're looking in the introduction of your outline, there's three things I want to emphasize. The first one is this. Jesus gave his disciples power and authority. Further in the outline, I rearranged it and I said he gave them the authority to operate in his power. But he gave them power and authority over demons and to cure diseases. And I'm going to spend some more time on this. This is a two-part lesson, okay? They were sent to preach. They had a message. Now, here's where I'm going to get you. What is your sermon right now? What is your message? If somebody walked up to you right now, are you just going to give them the plan of salvation or do you have a sermon? Do you have a message? What is your message? I'm here to tell you some good news. What's the message? My message to you tonight is you have the authority to operate in the power of Jesus Christ. You're nodding your head at me. You're supposed to say amen. amen. That means amen. so be it. Yes. How many of you have the power? Amen. How many of you have the authority? Amen. How many of you are going to put it to work? Amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> The thing is, in that first paragraph in the introduction, they were just ordinary people. Limited in the amount of real time that they had had with Jesus. You and I have been talking about, well, I've been saved 20 years, 30 years, whatever, you know. They had very limited time with Jesus. But their relationship with Jesus was so profound. They were convinced that if Jesus said, I can, then bless God, I can. My challenge to you tonight, can you be a can-do person? I can do all things through Christ. The anointed one with the anointing that breaks every yoke of bondage through Christ who strengthens me over and over in the Greek over and over and over he's strengthening me right now look at your neighbor and say I'm, I'm receiving strength right now say it out loud thank you Jesus I'm receiving strength right now glory hallelujah you can talk yourself happy you can talk yourself into victory or defeat. You can talk yourself into any frame set of mind you want to be in. And tonight we are overcomers. Yeah. Hallelujah. The second thing in the introduction and the second paragraph is this. In coming to earth, Jesus emptied himself. He laid aside his glory, his majesty, the power, and he came as a mere human being had no advantage over us when he got here. As a little baby, he had to be taken care of by his mama just like any other baby. He had to learn to walk. He had to learn how to feed himself. Somebody had to bathe him and take care of him until he could learn how to do all. He did everything that you and I had to experience in life. And never worked a miracle until after he received the Holy Spirit. Now, if you go back and read some books, I've got a book at home that said when he was a little boy, uh, he made a bird out of clay and threw the clay bird up in the air and it flew away. No, he didn't. Jesus never did anything as a mere man. And the only time he did anything was after he received the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit came upon him at the Jordan River. And read your Bible, the Holy Spirit led him 
into the wilderness to be tried and tested of the devil. We had to get stuff out of the way. Are you the son of God or not? Well, I want to ask you a question. Are you and I the sons of God or the daughters of God? Are we the sons and daughters of man? You put the brakes on, you did good. You see, as long as I think like a man, of, as long as I think like a woman, and I don't think like a representative of the kingdom of heaven, joint heirs with Jesus Christ, with the same power and authority that he had, I am never going to act outside of my carnality. I've got to start changing the way I think. Now, here's something else I want to tell you. Your name is written down in heaven, right? Have you read the scripture that says we've got a new name? I don't, I don't know what my new name is in heaven. But I do know this. He doesn't call me by an earthly name. He calls me by a heavenly name. Does that make any difference? It makes a big difference. I'm no longer Jim. I'm special. Aren't you special? Do you know who you are? You're a child of the king. You are blood kin to Jesus. You've had a transfusion. Wow. Third paragraph and third point in that introduction. Jesus' entire ministry was done as the Son of Man and not as the Son of God. But listen to this, John 14, 12. Jesus said, He who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also, and greater works than these he will do because I go to my Father. Now this is where we flunk the test. Because not one of us can raise our hand and say, well, I've done better than Jesus did while he was here. But yet, that's what Jesus said. And Jesus always got what he said. So church, we're about to change. We're about to become powerful in action, not just in words. You have authority to operate in the power. Point one, Jesus' ministry is an example we are to follow. Jesus' ministry is an example for us to follow. Listen, for centuries, the church put Jesus' ministry on such a pedestal, nobody could reach it. Oh, Jesus was Jesus, and look what Jesus did. Oh, we were, we're just a little humble peasant here. We're just barely going to make it and barely get by. But Jesus did all these wonderful things. The church actually taught that for centuries, that Jesus was untouchable. And he's our brother, and he's our friend. And he said, I'm with you always. And he said, I'll never leave you. Hello. Everything that Jesus did in the Gospels, everything that he did with the 12, everything that he did with the 70 is a game plan for you and me to follow. We have the game plan. What's the game plan, preacher? The game plan is simply this. Number one, you need to have a message. If somebody walked up to you right now and asked the question, are you a Christian? You would say yes. They might come back at you with this. Why 
Are you a Christian? Do you have a message? They, will, they may come up to you and say, I've, I've been watching you and I notice you go to church every Sunday. Why do you do that? Or they might say something like this. Man, I get so bored with church. Why do you keep going? Do you have a message? Is your message French fries from Whataburger? And a milkshake? Or is your message meat? You understand what I'm saying? What is your message? Jesus said, I'm giving you the message. Go tell them I'm coming. And he gave them things to see as evident that they were in the right place, doing the right thing, saying the right thing. And he threw this in and healed the sick. These guys have only been with Jesus about 18 months. And they're still blown away with the fact that he can just touch somebody and they're healed. Just speak to somebody and they're healed. Tell somebody, your faith made you whole, take off. And they walk away and get healed on their faith. Hmm. Do you believe that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever? Do you believe that that kind of a Jesus is in you right now? Amen. Then you can believe to get the same results that Jesus got. Amen. Yes. Yes. Don't wait till next week to get started. Start tonight. Whoa, preacher, I don't know about this. Looking at your outline one more time. Under point one, let us see, John fourteen ten. Jesus gave his father the credit for the work that happened in his personal ministry. He said, I didn't do this. My father did it. I have no problem with the triune Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It's all through the Bible. Even Jesus said, when you pray, say, Father. He said, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will do it. And he said, I will pray the Father that he will send you the Holy Spirit who will abide with you forever. And he will be your teacher, your comforter, and your paraclete. He'll work right beside you. I'm going to heaven, and you need the Holy Spirit here. I'm going to go talk to the Father while the Holy Spirit's talking to you. I believe in the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit Trinity. One God, yes. Three separate functions and positions. Am I doing okay? Amen. Second point. We have authority and power over demons and disease. Now, in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 10, verse 1, it comes across uh, power and authority. There's two words for power that's used in the Gospels and in the book of Acts. The one you're most familiar with is dunamis power. Now dunamis power, and you shall receive dunamis power after that the Holy Spirit has come upon you. It's the same word that we get dynamo and dynamite from. So dynamo means regenerating, regenerating, regenerating. Dynamite means bang, big explosion. I want you to know it's time for a big explosion in God's people. Amen. Boom. Come alive. <laughs> the other Greek word for power, and I have looked it up and everybody pronounces it differently
X O C R X U C R however you want to pronounce it it's going to be okay with me too but it translates authority and it's what's so important is in reading the uh, you have I give you power and authority power and authority it's always power and authority but if you look in the Greek word sometimes it's authority and power not power and authority and so it's better to translate it this way God has given us Jesus has given us authority to operate the power I went into this place I, it was some kind of a electrical generator type thing in fact I think it was a water uh, uh, a water dam was there and it generated electricity as a matter of fact and this one fellow is just sitting around standing around not doing very much and so I asked him, I said, what, what is your job here? He said, to turn it on or to turn it off. I said, what are we doing here tonight? Turning it on or turning it off? You understand what I'm saying here? It's time to turn it on, amen? Hallelujah. Amen. Glory to God. Everybody said, I've, I've got the power. When? Oh, just want to make sure you, just want to make sure. Letter B under point two, we have authority to use the power of God against unclean spirits and to heal all manner of sickness and disease. We have authority to use pow the power of God against unclean spirits and to heal all manner of sicknesses and diseases. We have the power and authority. We have it. Amen. That's why I've read it several times now. I've said it several times. Ladies and gentlemen, you have God's permission to use his power. Mm. 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 Now I want to do a little side trip on this next one. Let us see. When you understand your authority, you don't have to wear yourself out praying at the top of your lungs. I have been around all kind of Pentecosts, okay? And I have been around people that were genuinely uh, casting out devils. And I've done it. But one of the things that really bothered me as a young Christian was I saw a lot of physical demonstrations that were, to me, offensive. And I saw a lot of, I heard a lot of people yelling, yeah, 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 you know, this kind of thing. Come out of them in the name of Jesus, just yelling to the top of their lungs and everything. And I went back and studied the gospel. Jesus never did that. Yeah. Something else I learned. If I've got the goods, the demons leave me and my surroundings. They don't want to be around me. I told the story, I think Sunday, might have been a week ago, before, yeah, Sunday before. Young man, and he was not demon possessed, but there was an oppression. And he's lying on the floor, in fact, his head was up under the chair. And a zealous brother was over him, blood red in the face, and yelling and screaming and just doing all kinds of things and just carrying on. And so it was becoming a distraction. And so I just went over to him and I said, Brother, let me help you. I said, Give me some room. I wanted him to get out of my way. <laughs> Give me some room. And I took the young man by the hand 
and lifted him up and I said, son, you're free in Jesus' name. It's over from this moment on. He got up and said, thank you, and began to praise the Lord. I kept up with him for two years after that. He's fine. Now, the brother that was praying for him meant well, and he was doing the right thing, but he was doing it in his physical strength. You don't do it in your physical strength. It's either in the strength that God gives you, the power and authority that he gives you, or you got no business doing it. Hello. I had one fellow that was... He wasn't demon possessed. Influence, I think, is a better word. But he was doing these physical things. And everybody thought, he's full of the devil, he's full of the devil. And this is, happened right about here. I walked over to him. I got him by the collar. I said, look at me. Stop it. Nobody around me knows what I'm doing or what I'm saying. When I said stop it, he looked at me. I said, don't you ever let the devil do that again. Take charge right now. Are you going to let Jesus Christ be Lord or are you going to let evil influence be Lord? Oh, Jesus. I said, act like it. Hello. Now, I can take that from a serious demonstration to something much milder and say sometime we don't act like Jesus is in charge. Hello. Is Jesus in charge of your situation or are you in charge of it? Is Jesus in charge of your situation or is the devil in charge of it? Is Jesus in charge of your situation or are you in charge of it? You understand what I'm saying? You have the authority to operate in the power. Amen. Point three. We'll come back to this. This is, this is just the first part. Okay? This is part one. But point three in our outline for tonight. Faith is not intimidated by circumstances. You understand the circumstances? I'll tell you what, there's more circumstances going around me right now than I, that I, I don't even want to talk about it. Mm. Letter A, most of the church has never seen the kind of miracles you read about in the Gospels. And so they, don't, they can't relate to what we're talking about. We had a lady, a missionary in South America. She developed muscular dystrophy, is that right? She was in a wheelchair, they brought her back to the States. And in the wonderful church, she was parked by the front row. William Branham walked over to her and said, Sister, you've seen miracles around the world. And you know God can heal you. She said, Yes, sir. He said to her, Then get out of that wheelchair and walk in Jesus' name. She got out of the wheelchair and took off running. She ran around the building a couple of times. She stayed down front praising the Lord and sat back down in that wheelchair and never walked again. Burn your wheelchair. You understand what I'm saying? Burn your wheelchair. I believe with all of my heart, if she had just left that wheelchair alone, she would have been fine. Now, 
I don't want to make a judgmental statement. I could be wrong. But I still believe it. She'd have stayed away from that wheelchair. She'd have been all right. That's me. I'm just telling you. Okay. But my problem is this. I'm up here teaching you something that most of the church had never seen anything like that. They've never seen the dead raised. They've never seen somebody completely cured of cancer instantly. They've never seen a person get off of a sick bed and start running around praising God. My job was to help Oral Roberts get that last meeting there in Pensacola. He did one tent meeting after that in Birmingham, and from that point on, he was always on TV. No more tent meetings. My job was to get him from the trailer through the prayer tent, you've heard me tell this, to the big tent, to the stage. I got him out of the trailer, and he went ahead of me. Well, I knew he was going to go through the prayer tent. I thought I was supposed to be leading. No, he was leading me. He walked through the prayer tent. We came in like on this side of the prayer tent. This session was reserved for those people that were afflicted, but was able to make it to the service. Approximately out of that prayer tent where they brought people in ambulances, wheelchairs, anything to get them there. Approximately 400 people were healed in that tent and followed him through that door and sat in that session. He never touched a one of them. Not a single one of them. Never touched them. They believed. Jesus made this statement to a fellow who said, do you believe I can do this? And the fellow said, yes. This fellow had asked for mercy. Was he asking for healing or was he asking for mercy? He said, Jesus, have mercy. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. He said, do you believe I can do this? Yes then your faith has made you whole. Are you listening to me? I want to be able to walk up to people and say to them, do you believe I can do this? What, have mercy on you? Yes. Graceful? Yes, have grace, mercy. I go to Walmart, a lot of them know I'm a preacher. But there was an employee, a new employee. He'd met James Carroll. There's another guy that works there, has been there for years. And both of those guys had told him that Victory Christian Center believes in healing, deliverance. And they mentioned Teen Challenge, of course. I had never met the guy until this one day I walked in there and I hear somebody say, Pastor, well, that's my name. I turned around and hear this guy come running toward me and I'm thinking, I don't know this guy, what's going on here? He said, I know about you. Okay. He said, I need deliverance from drugs. And the guys here tell me, you know how to pray. I said, do you believe Jesus can set you free? Yes, sir. I said, have you ever given your heart to Christ? A long time ago, I said, you need to rededicate your life right now. And he'll set you free. I'm not the one to set you free. He set you free, but I'm, I'm his hands. I said, give me your hand. We join hand. I like to touch people because the Holy Spirit tells me things when I touch people. 
Uh, I had a, one of my youth who played football in the high school there in Pensacola wound up being a pastor in uh, Branson, Missouri for years. And one Sunday night I walked up to him and I said, hey, Melvin, how you doing? I stuck my hand out, he put both hands behind his back and said, it's none of your business what I've been doing. <laughs> Oh, boy. I can tell when I hold somebody's hand if they're being truthful. That's the biggie. I led him through a prayer of rededication. I said, now look, the same Jesus that just healed you spiritually has healed your body and your mind. You're free from drugs. That's been over two years and he's still clean. You understand what I'm saying? Folk, it's time for us to step it up. Amen. Can you say amen? amen? Have I done all right tonight? Amen. Is there anything left in that outline I want to get before I leave here? Let me look. I see something marked here. Yes, I see it. I see it. I see it. Here we are. Letter B. Most Christians are governed by the traditional teaching of man instead of what the Bible says. I've had a conversation with one of my sisters here tonight about Calvinism and Armenian. The Calvinists believe this, the Armenians believe that. Somebody asked me one time, are you Calvinist or are you Armenian? That's man's teaching. I said, I'm right in the middle. Both of them have some points that are good and both of them have some points that are not good. Hello. Stick with the word, not with the teaching of man, but stick with the word. Let us see. Be adamant about what you believe. Check yourself. Why do I believe this? Where is it in the Bible? And look for the witness of multiple scriptures, not just one. At least three. One out of the Old Testament, one out of the New Testament, one out of the Psalms, and you'll be okay. God bless you. Have a great evening. Give the Lord a praise. Hallelujah. Shout to all the people